When your pet doesn't want to eat, it could be more than just a lack of appetite. On this episode of the Paw Report, Dr. Gregory Mock from the Kaskaskia Valley Animal Hospital in Sullivan joins us to talk about pancreatitis. We'll discuss causes and treatment options for pet owners, so stay with us. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Welcome back to this episode of the Paw Report, and we're joined by a reoccurring guest. We're so always glad to have him with us, Dr. Gregory Mock from the Kaskaskia Valley Animal Hospital over in Sullivan, Illinois. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, <coughs> Dr. Mock and I were talking, and he said, you know, one of the topics I think we ought to discuss is pancreatitis. And I think it's a very good topic. You know, naturally humans get it, but, um, or have that uh, condition, and mm -hmm. our pets do too. So. What is the function of our pancreas? Well, the uh, one thing about pancreatitis, it probably sounds really boring, <laughs> but. You're gonna make it interesting. I do. Pancreatitis is a multifaceted disease, which also means it's multifascinating. So, because the pancreas is a very complex organ. And so when the pancreas has problems, lots of stuff can go wrong. And so, um, it makes it an interesting disease, even though it could be a very devastating disease. But the pancreas itself is a um, glandular tissue. And um, people always ask, you know, you think about the pancreas and, you know, people kind of have an idea of what your liver looks like, your stomach, things like that. But most people really have no idea what the pancreas even looks like or where it's at. You just know it's somewhere in here. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a strange shaped little thing. It's kind of slightly V-shaped. It's about as thick and wide as a piece of bacon. And so when it lays along the very last part of the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine. And it kind of looks not like a bunch of grapes, but somewhat kind of like that, all <laughs> glumped together. Um, and so it's actually a gland um, and it's a two-part gland. It, uh, most glands do one, basic thing. Um, they're either an exocrine gland, like a sweat gland, which is producing stuff to come out to the surface, or they're an endocrine gland, like your thyroid, and all of its products go into the blood. Well, the pancreas is a mixed gland. It uh, is both. It, it's an exocrine and an endocrine gland. So its exocrine function is that it produces the digestive enzymes that go down the ducts from the pancreas and are dumped into the intestine and help digest your food. The endocrine part of the pancreas is extremely important and it's what produces insulin and glucagon or the two biggies which can control your glucose levels to your blood. So insulin of course brings them down, glucagon makes them go up. And so it has both of those types of functions. Um, so when you get pancreatitis, it's a defect in the exocrine part where um, the enzymes that are made in there are activated within the pancreas instead of going in the ducts and being dumped, and you actually start digesting your own pancreas. So that's, that's the basic thing with pancreatitis is called auto um, digestion. And which is horrible, obviously. It sounds like <laughs> it. Well, what causes, so, um, what can cause pancreatitis? Well, lots of things can cause it. Um, lots of times when we have it, we don't know why in this individual patient they've got it. Um, but you can be, ha, get it, for example, from having trauma to your abdomen. Um, that's not very common. Um, so you would, you would know that. Um, very commonly, uh, matter of fact, we, had some issues this week after the fourth. So after a holiday, 
we'll have a bunch of animals come in who either have severe intestinal problems or they've got pancreatitis because they eat a bunch of junk over the holiday they don't normally eat. Mm -hmm. And the things that cause big problems are fatty foods. Fats, um, when they hit your stomach, they cause the release of lots of acids, um, other hormones from your stomach, which signal the pancreas, hey, I've got a big bunch of stuff coming your way and the intestines make a bunch of enzymes for me. And so then all these enzymes start being produced and released and sometimes if there's so much fat that's been ingested that they're producing so many enzymes that they can't get them out of the pancreas before they're activated and then the pancreas starts digesting itself. So that's, that's probably the most common time that we recognize a cause is after a, like a big fatty meal, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And that'll happen in, in people too. They'll go out and Saturday evening and eat a bunch of greasy food that they don't <laughs> normally eat and end up Sunday in the hospital, pancreatitis flare up. Oh my, so, well, what are the symptoms that you see? Um, you know, if a patient comes in, what do you normally see in a dog and a cat and your light bulb goes off and you're like, I know right. this is exactly yep. what I need to be looking for. Well, the big issues um, is probably the number one thing is vomiting. Um, now we get vomiting from lots of other things. Sure. So we're thinking pancreatitis a lot. Every day we're considering, does this animal have pancreatitis? Um, so, so that's the number one thing. Pancreatitis is a, can be a very sneaky disease. Um, it's the type of thing, it's one of these diseases that's a pretender disease. It can look like a lot of stuff. Um, but the most typical things are vomiting and abdominal pain. Your pancreas sits about right here, right under your xiphoid, um, which is the end of your sternum. And so if you push up under there on a person or an animal, um, then that hurts. And so, you know, it's, that's one thing. We'll have this vomiting dog, and then I will be looking at him and be pushing up here, and he's, uh, uh, you know, grunting mm -hmm. like that. And that makes me very suspicious. But I had a dog last week that was highly positive on the pancreatitis test and um, really had no pain. But um, I'm, I was sure he had pancreatitis, he had all the other symptoms, but he, he wasn't painful at all. Mm -hmm. But that is a, a, the usual things we see is vomiting and pain. But you can get lots of other things um, with that too. They can come in deathly ill, septicemic, um, uh, literally flat out on their deathbed from pancreatitis. Other times it can be very vague and you don't, you know, they may have come in, have a little upset stomach, acting totally normal otherwise, but sometimes they'll look at records and say, you know, this dog, he was in here and then three months later he was in again for just acting off and again, you know, so that kind of raises our suspicion. Maybe he's having chronic low grade flare ups and we need to look for it. So it can be anything from, yeah, I just don't feel great mm -hmm. to I'm in ICU, mm. so. Well, as a pet owner, you know, the most severe cases as you just defined, I think that you're immediately going to the vet, but the not so obvious, the not so severe, a pet owner may wait and see if it subsides, mm -hmm, but sure. how, how long should you wait before you decide to come in and how soon can damage be done to the pancreas? Well, that's a tough thing because it looks like so many other things. Like I had a dog in this morning who was quite ill, vomiting, and did not have pancreatitis, but he could have, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't really know unless you do the test. But if a dog is, um, or a cat, person, I'm repeatedly vomiting and you're doing simple things like I took my food and water away, maybe I gave him a dose of, you know, kaopectate or something like that and he continues to vomit, then that's definitely, anytime you can't stop vomiting, um, then that's something that needs to be seen. Mm -hmm. So that would be the no. And then, you know, we wouldn't even know. We might be suspicious. There's, there's nothing I can look at a dog and say, yes, you have pancreatitis, or no, you don't have it. The only way I can know that is to do certain tests. And the tests aren't like any other test. We think of lab tests as being black and white, either yes or they're no, mm -hmm. and most things are not like that. And pancreatitis tests are one of those things that are not like that. Um, so we have to 
you know, look at everything else, look at the test, and then, you know, make a clinical judgment on top of that. You mentioned the 4th of July, and my next question is, why do you see cases? I suppose the 4th of July isn't the only holiday that you no. would see spikes in cases. No. The December holidays, probably. It, does it all go back to the <laughs> no. foods? Yeah, you, that's very typical. And I had the classic thing a few years ago on January the 2nd. <laughs> and so January the 2nd, I had four dogs come in, all of them deathly Different ill. Different families. Different families. And all of them horribly sick, vomiting, diarrhea. One guy had been sitting at home all day feeding his dog um, cream cheese pickle rolls. Another guy fed his dog. Sounds delicious, <laughs> yeah. but maybe not for Fido. <laughs> no, one or two. But I'm afraid he didn't, wasn't in the hospital himself. But um, the other guy gave his dog, a little chihuahua, six pieces of bacon. And both of those dogs had raging pancreatitis. The other two dogs did not. They just had horrible GI problems. Um, but both of those dogs died from the pancreatitis because it was so bad. Oh. And, and I told the guy with the, the bacon, you know, the dog weighed six pounds and he fed it six pieces of bacon. And, you know, I said, you know, not to tell everybody my weight, but I'd be like me eating 180 pieces of bacon. Well, if I sat down and ate a piece per pound, 180 pieces of bacon, then, you know, I, I would probably die right, right. from all of that stuff. So that's the typical thing. A lot of these are, are situations like that, that in the, you know, in a natural situation that dog would not get into, but he was, was given that. And, you know, it's one of those, they were killed with kindness oh. things. So, yeah. um, but, but that's real typical after weekends and somebody's had a cookout and the dogs ate 12 hot dogs and, um, and animals will engorge themselves. Dogs will, cats don't tend to do that, but dogs will. And that's what they, they do in, in the, in, you know, out in the w real world is they engorge on meats and things. And, um, and so if they're getting handed hot dogs, they just keep eating. They're gonna eat, yeah. yeah. What is the difference, Dr. Monk, between acute and chronic pancreatitis? Well, um, you hear that. Yes. And it, it, it is very important. Um, acute pancreatitis, of course, is one that's just occurred. We're assuming that before this episode, you had a perfectly normal pancreas at that point in time. And so something happened, like ate a whole bunch of something they shouldn't have. Um, or a lot of, you know, I'm acting like I'm blaming the owners for all of this. That's, you know, those are really the exception. The vast majority of time, we have no idea why they're there with pancreatitis. Um, so a lot of times it does just spontaneously occur. Um, but a, an acute case, we're assuming they had a normal um, pancreas before this, they're acutely ill, which gives us a good chance of turning things around and things healing up. Um, once they clear that, those enzymes out of their pancreas, things will heal and hopefully get completely back to normal. Chronic pancreatitis is just what it says. I mean, it's a, this chronic disease process. So if you looked at a um, pancreas from an animal, and cats have a lot of this. Um, they looked at a, a number of cats that were euthanized at shelters a few years ago in a study, and um, a significant percentage of them had lesions of chronic pancreatitis. So, so you get scarring. Um, in there you get uh, infiltration with white blood cells that are of a typical type we see with chronic lesions. And so when you have the scarring, the things like that, it's easy to have another episode because those enzymes now are not in healthy glands, they're in scarred glands and so they can leak out easier. On the back side of the um, glandular material, there's a membrane and it's, um, you know, if it's intact, very little stuff's gonna leak through it. Mm -hmm. But if it's damaged and scarred, then you can have an easier leakage. And so you can start a whole nother cycle again. Mm -hmm. And you just keep doing that over and over. There's, um, some of those animals will destroy the other parts of their um, pancreas that produce the insulin and those other hormones. And so there's kind of an argument over how 
uh, much that leads to um, diabetic problems down the road. Um, you know, when I was in school 30 years ago, they thought that was a huge issue, and then they decided, no, it's not, and now some people say, well, maybe it is. So they don't really know, but that would make sense if, right. if you had chronic pancreatitis that you could damage the endocrine parts mm -hmm. of your, and then develop diabe diabetes and things on top of, of all of this. You've made the diagnosis and you've just given examples to multiple cases, then what? What, what is the treatment options yep. uh, for dogs and cats? Well, um, just real quick, as far as making the diagnosis, other than looking at them clinically, we do a blood test. Now, um, the old tests for pancreatitis were very sloppy, pretty worth, we don't even do them anymore. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've had a very specific test for pancreatitis come out. It's called pancreatic lipase. And um, lipase is an enzyme. It's made in the pancreas. It's a, it breaks down fats. You also make it in lots of other areas of your body. So the old test measured just your lipase levels. And if they were super high, you could pro you probably had pancreatitis maybe, but maybe you had some disease in one of the other organs that produces that. Um, the specific one we've got now is specifically for pancreatic lipase. It only measures that one. So it specifically picks up elevations of that in the blood. And then we know if it's elevated, it's definitely coming from the pancreas. So that's the new test for it. It's not 100% accurate, but it's in the upper 90s. So if we get a positive on that, uh, we can be pretty darn sure they've got it, but not 100%. And if it's negative, we can't be 100% sure they don't have it. But it, it helps us out a bunch. So that's our main test other than looking at CBCs and other blood chemistries to make sure we don't have other diseases that would mimic pancreatitis. Um, so, but once we've decided, yes, we've got pancreatitis. Um, so they looked at, I, matter of fact, I went to a meeting last fall on, uh, it was an entire day of vomiting and diarrhea. <laughs> So fun. yes, it was <laughs> great. So which is a, a good thing to go to because that's even this morning I was there half a day. You know I saw three or four animals vomiting and diarrhea. Yesterday's five or six. So that's a huge problem. Obviously we deal with. You know people come in. My dog is vomiting. Has got diarrhea. You know so then we've got to decide amongst the many 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 things that can cause that. What is doing it? Well anyway went to my meeting, and one of them was on pain, acute pancreatitis and and um, treatment options. And so they looked at all of these treatments and what of those things, and they based them on a scale of one to five, um, what was useful and what wasn't. Um, so the number one most useful thing for pancreatitis um, is fluids. Because we want, real commonly with pancreatitis, we get severe dehydration. And one of the things that really sends up a red flag for me is if I look at a percentage of the blood that's red blood cells, which normally should be 30 to 35 up to 50%, if it's above um, 55 or 60, then I get real suspicious of pancreatitis um, because typically that's what happens. Um, so I'll have a dog come in, check that it's 70%. I mean, he may not have pancreatitis, but I am really, 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 really got that on the top of my list at that point in time. So fluids are super important to get rid of that dehydration and to flush the pancreas. We want lots of blood going through the pancreas, getting those enzymes out of there. Because if they're, if they're dehydrated and our blood flow is just trickling through, they're gonna sit there and keep digesting away. Mm. Um, and those enzymes, there's proteases, eat protein, there's those lipases, destroy, destroy fat, there's nucleases that destroy DNA, there's amylases that destroy sugars. I mean, it is just eating this thing alive. And so, you know, fluids are our number one thing by far. If we just had to pick one thing to do, we'd put a catheter in and blast fluids through. Mm. The second item that's very helpful is pain control um, because the, whenever you have, the pancreas, pancreas is, is a very touchy organ. If it's inflamed, it gets really painful. Whenever you're painful, you release lots of chemicals in your body, steroids, things like that, which cause lots of other problems and issues and keep the pancreatitis rolling. Um, so we want to get pain control in there to, and, and to calm the animal down so he can relax and stop 
doing all those other bad things to his body. So those are the, the top Once. two things. Antibiotics have been traditionally used, but pancreatitis is not an infective disease. It can become infected, but rarely is it going to be caused by an infection. Mm -hmm. So they're not at the top of our list. Now, I always use antibiotics because I don't want, once the pancreas isn't functioning and things flowing down the ducts to the gut, then things in the gut, which are all those nasty bacteria that live in there, then can walk up the duct and get into the pancreas. So we wanna prevent that. So we do antibiotics, but more as a preventative thing to keep a lid on stuff as opposed to a treatment. The other things that we'll do is give them um, sometimes drugs that counteract toxin, endotoxin in the body, which is produced by um, bacteria, but also um, the digestion of the pancreas releases nasty chemicals into the body. And the absolute worst thing that could happen with pancreatitis is there is a chemical that's released from a dying pancreatic cells that's called myocardial depressant factor, or MDF. So your myocardium is your heart muscle. The depressant factor, it is a toxic chemical that's released that can stop your heart. Oh boy. And we have seen that numerous times. So years ago, a few years ago, I had a dog in the office with acute pancreatitis and he was okay, um, doing fine. And I was standing by his cage doing some stuff with these fluids and he looked at me and he got this glassy eyed look and he just went plop and fell over dead. Oh. And his heart was completely stopped. And so that was a perfect example of myocardial depressant factor and there wasn't any starting it again. Wow. Um, a few months ago we had the same thing happen. We had a dog with pancreatitis standing on our surgery table we were working with and the same exact same thing happened. He just collapsed and died. So that's, uh, that's a bad thing. We can't do anything about myocardial right. depressant factor. And I always warn people with pancreatitis, it looks good, it may do fine, but you have to understand that this dog may die acutely like this. Dr. Mock, we just have a couple of seconds. Quickly, um, what can we do to prevent it? I suppose it starts with diet. Diet is the absolute number one, feeding a good quality, balanced diet. And the number two by far is controlling obesity. Um, dogs that are overweight have far more pancreatitis than skinny dogs. We see plenty of skinny dogs with it, but if you're overweight, you're much more likely to get it. So those would be the top two recommendations. Great information today as always. Thank you, Dr. Mock, for joining us Great. on this well, episode of the, of the Paw Report. And we also thank you for spending some time with us here on the Paw Report. We'll see you next time. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with the Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. An English Springer Spaniel has been enlisted to detect the most common of healthcare facility superbugs at a hospital in Canada. Chris Brown introduces us to Angus in this Paw Report Extra. Angus, the English Springer Spaniel, has a nose that can smell almost anything. We call it the super sniffer. Angus can search out very small, minute quantities of bacteria that you can't uh, detect otherwise. He belongs to Teresa Zerberg, and she's trained him to sniff out the C. difficile bacteria, a superbug that makes lots of people sick, especially at hospitals. In a demonstration outside of her suburban Vancouver home, Angus found the hidden claws with the C. diff scent in no time. Yeah, good boy! Odor to a dog is like color to us. So it's easy for him to pick out that shade that says C. diff to him. So Today, Angus showed off his sniffing skills for the media at Vancouver General Hospital, where he's now the first fully trained C. diff sniffing dog in Canada. 
we use a lot of antibiotics. And antibiotics predispose you to acquiring this organism. Dr. Elizabeth Bryce says C. diff causes diarrhea and can be fatal to patients who are already quite sick. Hospitals normally use ultraviolet light to find the C. diff spores, but Angus works fast and he can be extremely precise. We can now target areas. Let's say we had a cluster of cases. We could now hopefully bring Angus in. He could tell us whether there's any hidden reservoirs and then we can do additional cleaning. It was Teresa Zerberg's own experience with C. diff that led to all this. She got an infection and almost died. With her background training dogs to sniff out drugs and bombs, she wondered why not bacteria? Now maybe other Canadian hospitals will find a place for super sniffer noses like Angus's. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com.